As our colleagues in the immigrant justice movement know, who are here with us tonight, we can't rest yet. When we fight together, we win. There are other exciting contests that come to mind. When ASAM started 13 years ago, we were a handful of people that competed to stay to laptops, or you know what we call the national grassroots organization. Um, but we knew what our community needed, and we were willing to work ourselves to the bone to get us there. And now, 13 years later, look at all the different ways we can mobilize our people. Look at all the places we can show up for our community. We've trained over 100 different college students and community organizers to our summer leadership academy. Our latest day of mourning has 42 different sites in five different countries. We've worked to get legislation introduced that would expand access to effective communications with non speaking autistics and other AAC users. And we're working on bills that expand access to home community based services for people with all kinds of disabilities. ASAM's work was central to getting long term services in place, including an end to laziness and an end to institutional bias, included in all three of the universal health care bills that were introduced this year. We're suing, thank you, it <laughs> was hard. Um, we're suing Fairfax County Public Schools along with students and families from starting and supporting students with disabilities. The sheer number of things on our agenda for 2020 makes me exhausted, but also incredibly excited. There is so much work that needs to be done, and so much unmet in our community, and every year we are able to take on a little bit more. We've come so long, inch by inch by inch. There's another more frustrating contrast that I've run into a lot this year, and that's the gap between the basic set of standards for advocacy that we see in the broader disability world and the standards in the opposite world. Uh, for those of you with a good sense of not to spend your days up to your eyeballs in autism politics, I will give you an example. Um, this year, there were two different bodies created to oversee major policy decisions about disability. The first was an advisory panel for the National Quality Forum, which I've had a bit of an example this year, that was tasked with setting standards person-centered planning in Medicaid. And the second was the Interagency Office of Coordinating Committee, or IAC, which is placed within NIH to oversee federal investments in office research. When the National Quality Forum panel was announced, we had only one identifiable health advocate and no leadership from the intellectual disability or mental health communities, the disability community revolted. ASAM, in conjunction with Nickel and several other groups, led a series of letters to the National Quality Forums, the MS, and the Administration on Community Living, and we received broad support from across the entire disability community. I remember bringing up this issue almost immediately after it became public to the head of the Administration on Community Living in a meeting about a different topic. And I remember being floored as a dozen other advocates from a wide range of organizations without any preparation immediately jumped into that. That kind of thing doesn't happen in the opposite world. There was unquestioning agreement that the status quo was unacceptable, that self-advocates would lead the fight, and that meaningful representation was non-negotiable. We won a partial victory by the end of that summer, and we won that thanks to the immediate, broad-based support that we The debate over the IAC occurred among opposite organizations, and so it played out very differently. ASAN, as the lone self-advocate voice in the room, urged for a real increase in self-advocate representation. Right now, self-advocates make up less than 7% of the total representation on the IAC. We had the support of a few major cross-disability organizations, like the ARCs and Anchor, who are with us today, um, and the other office groups opposed us. Our request, uh, the interest request, was for half, and then one-third, of the public members of the IAC to be self-advocates, which, again, the members in the room, would have been still less than 25% or 15% respectively of the total membership of the IAC. Um, but we were told that that was too much. And we were being unreasonable. We should be happy with what we get already, that 7%. Um, the federal government spends over $292 million on medicine research each year, which represents over 80% of the total research funding and as autistic people, we don't have a right to any sort of meaningful oversight of that spending. That was the message that we got. 
But the awesome organizations were challenged by other disability groups on this. They said, and they all lacked significant self-advocate staff and leadership. And they responded that our request was too controversial and would jeopardize the passage of the bill and the millions of dollars that it authorized. Of course, the reality is that if we'd all been able to present and provide friends on this, the change would have been made easily because it didn't cost a single dollar. But they didn't want more self-advocate voices. Autistic people didn't have the support of the organizations that make millions and millions of dollars of money. So in the end, we got one, one additional self-advocate on the planet. And this is part of a broader trend in 2019, which saw a great deal of articles in various news outlets attacking the diversity movement. Over and over again, the criticism was the same. Civil rights are okay for some autistic people, we guess we really want them. But some autistic people are just too disabled for them. The neurodiversity movement should back off and let the members of our community with the most significant disabilities be segregated, silenced, and warehoused. And we should be grateful for what we get. We're at the table now. What more do we want? And ultimately, that's the contrast I thought about the most this year. The way self-advocates get treated in these types of discussions versus the way non-disabled people are. Whose voices matter? Who gets to be real? Who's listened to? Who's seen as an authority? And who is chastised because token should be seen and not heard? Every year, an organization called the International Society for Autism Research, or INSAR, holds a big international meeting. Autism researchers from all over the world come to present their findings. Most of the research featured is not the kind of research that self-advocates necessarily find particularly ethical or useful or compelling, but as the number of autistic researchers has grown, more and more autistic people have started to show up too. It was estimated that approximately 5% of attendees at NSAR this past year were openly, openly autistic. <laughs> right. This, obviously, is bridge too far. NSAR <laughs> uh, had begun to make really modest measures to improve the visibility of the conference, like introducing the idea of flap, don't clap. This caused an uproar, which generated multiple news articles in response to self-advocate suggestions for more research focused on what autism looks like in possible lifespan and what services and supports are the most helpful, INSTAR announced a renewed focus on basic biology in the search of connection and cure. Are you an autistic person who wants to say in how millions of dollars are being used in your name? This is not your year. The people in lab coats know best, as they always have. In a research project not related to autism, I was asked to advise on the method of presentation for some data regarding the lives of people with developmental disabilities. I encouraged the researchers to prioritize accessibility in their presentation and to make sure they made materials that self-advocates can use too. The response I received was, that's a big ask. <laughs> it's a big ask to make sure the people that the data is about can understand what the data says and how it's going to be used. That is not a big ask. It is the absolute minimum. So that is are used to this. We know that our asks are going to be routinely described as a ceiling, when in fact they are fairly easy to score, like basement, sub-basement. As our founder, our Nathan likes to say, autism researchers often seem to wish they were geologists, conducting research on subjects that don't talk about. <laughs> And as this year has shown us in many different ways, this problem is hardly limited to researchers. But we aren't lost. And if you can't handle self-advocate feedback, you need to find a different job. I am reminded of another quote by the late um, Congressman John Finkel. Elected officials do not have power. They hold power in trust for the people who elected them. They misuse or abuse that public trust. It is quite properly the to put them back. Autism and disability organizations are not to be run by elected officials, but the premise applies. If you run one of these organizations, you have your job because of us, because of autism people and people with developmental disabilities. You are accountable to us. 
you are making millions of dollars off of us, if you are building careers off of us, if you have named your organizations after us, and if you are advocating on our behalf, then we have an absolute right to tell you what we think about that. Your legitimacy is derived from us. That means you are accountable to us. In what universe is this controversial? <laughs> So, at the end of the day, conversations about self-advocate representation, participation, and leadership come down to a couple of very simple questions. Do we exist? Do we have a right to have an opinion about that? Or not? And those questions are insulting. Of course we talk back. We aren't box. Our honorees are talking back. Dora Raymaker, who can't be with us tonight, unfortunately, is pioneering the practice of community-based participatory research in Austin science, placing us with the people at the center of research about our lives. Sarah Luderman has spent many, many years talking back with outlet after outlet, countering this, providing us with perspectives on stories about us, and finding ways to lift up marginalized voices. Hein Choi of the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition has spent the last several years talking back to the President of the United States and making it abundantly clear that no, we are not going to do this. Families belong together, no one is a burden, everyone matters. And at this event, the point of this gala is that we celebrate that. We celebrate talking back. So my challenge to you all, to all of our non-disabled allies in the room, and all of those who couldn't be here tonight, is to ask yourself, how will you respond when we talk back to you, to your friends? When we say, no, that's not okay. When we say, you need to be better. When we draw a line that is harder than the one you've drawn. When we say, this isn't about best practice, this is a moral issue. When we say, just do it, like Sage said in front of the When we say, you are getting this wrong and you are hurting us. And this is hard stuff. It's the hard work of allyship. But please consider this is a courtesy heads up because ASAN has invested so many of our resources into talking back. You're not just going to get it from us. We've invested in toolkits and trainings to ensure that self advocates, when they have a seat at the table, we aren't content with table scraps. We developed an entirely new way for folks to communicate with their elected officials, and we're building a grassroots that is used to regular campaigns and mobilization. We are fighting for the right of every non-speaking person to have access to robust, effective communication, for the right of every person deemed incompetent to make their own decisions with support, and for every person to control the support they receive. We are deeply engaged in community-based participatory research about how we define autism itself. And most importantly, we are making sure every person in our community can exercise their right to it's popular to say in disability advocacy that advocates are speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves. ASN has always been very clear that no, that's not it. We're not speaking for anyone. We are fighting for everyone's right to speak for themselves. We all have a voice, no matter how we express it, and we're all going to be heard. That's what ASN is about. That's the whole point. Nothing about us without us isn't a fine idea. It's a promise. I said that before, and I'll say it again. We're not rocks. We're not passive subjects. We have a voice, and we intend to use it. We know that using our voice has never been more important than it's going to be in 2020. We will vote, we will shape policy, and we will show up. We will fight for a better world for our entire community, as self-advocates, as a disability community, and as members of our democracy, we will make it very clear. Nothing about us. Us. And I hope we can do that with the support of a broad coalition of allies. I hope that next year I can still have you. <laughs> I hope that 10 years from now, the bitter fights we're enmeshed in won't even be controversial because we will have moved on to a future that is more equitable, more inclusive, and more reflective of the communities and organizations they may serve. I hope we'll be past arguing over 7%, 15%. Because we'll have moved on from table scraps and into the real needs of our community needs and how to get it. I hope self advocates from all sorts of backgrounds who communicate in all sorts of ways will be leading the conversation. And I hope that when we say something is wrong, we aren't the only ones saying We've gotten a lot of practice in the last three years and these past 13 years. 
um, what some folks call the discipline of hope. And I think we're ready to watch it.